It's been a difficult year for the Jewish people. It's been a difficult year for Israel since October 7th. A horrific attack, uh, as said, that since the days of the Holocaust, uh, the Jewish people had not had such a dark day like the 7th of October. And what made it even extra painful, like a dagger stuck into the heart, is that it happened on what is supposed to be the happiest day on Simchas Torah, which is one of the happiest days on the Jewish calendar. But it's not only that, it's the continuation of the war that's going on and, and soldiers have been falling every day. It's very painful. The hostages are still, um, many of them held in Gaza and we're worried, sick. Jewish people have really one heart. We're so deeply connected to each other and we are literally worried, sick for their well-being. It is a very difficult time. Anti-Semitism has exploded across the entire world. People we thought of our friends turned out that not such good friends. It's difficult. And here's a word of comfort to my Jewish brothers and sisters the world over. And to all Gentiles who are awaiting a good day, a beautiful day the day that God's light will shine upon the world forever and ever and ever. We've been told by the greatest rabbis that we are already at the threshold of the redemption. Primarily, the leader of our generation, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, spoke so clearly 30 years ago in 1990, 1991, 1992, telling the world and telling the Jewish people the time of redemption has arrived. And that seems to make it even worse, the insult on the injury, because how is it that we are supposed to be living in the times of the redemption, and yet such pain, such sorrow, such difficulty? So here we have a lesson from the Torah portion we read this week, which should be very comforting to all of us. The Torah relates the story of the first exodus. We, the Jewish people, know that primarily there are two moments of redemption in history. One is the redemption of Egypt, and one is going to be the grand redemption of the great exile that we've been already for close to 2,000 years. The verse actually compares these, in Isaiah, and compares these two um, redemptions. As it says, As the days that you went out of Egypt, God promises us, I will show you wonders. So there's a comparison between the past and the future. So when we take a look in the Torah portion, in the beginning of Exodus, first Torah, the first portion, Parsha Shemos, it relates how after God chooses the Redeemer and he sends him to Egypt to bring a message of hope, and a message of redemption to the Jewish people. They heard what he says. His words were like cold water on a tired, exhausted soul. They were drinking every droplet that came out of Moses' mouth, of Moshe's mouth. They were comforted. They were soothed. They believed that the redemption was on hand. And then Moshe, off he goes to Pharaoh's palace, and he's going to beseech and ask for the release of the Jewish people from this horrific bondage and slavery. What happens? It backfires terribly. Instead of releasing the Jewish people, Paro, as the verse describes, increases the slavery, intensifies the brutality. Initially, everybody had a certain quota of bricks that they needed to build in the, in the, um, in the labor camps. They had these big infrastructure of cities that they were building whether it was the pyramids or whatever the Jewish people were building during that time. Now, um, Pharaoh, you know, in, you know, the point of here was to crush the Jewish people, so they had a lot of work to do. But until then, the, at least the Egyptians were supplying them with the, with the um, materials which were needed in order to make the bricks, which were straw and various different things that they used for the brick making. But now, when Pharaoh hears from Moshe that um, the Jews are dreaming of vacation, of going out and serving God and so on and so forth, he gets angry and he says, you have too much time in your hands. I am removing that. I'm taking that away from you. And now 
you are going to collect your own materials, which probably occupied half of the work time, of the work day, was to collect and seek out the straw, which meant that they had much less time to actually build the, the, the building, to do the construction. Since they didn't do the construction, when they didn't finish the, 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 the amount that they needed, they were viciously beaten. Not only that, Paro would take, the e Egyptians would take humans, children of those builders that were supposed to build, and for every bit, for every brick that was missing, they would take a child and build them and cement them into the wall. It was horrors, the worst horror imaginable. Moses comes back to God with a complaint, and he says, why did you send me? Why did you do bad to the people? Why did you send me? And God answers Moshe, the last word in the Torah portion, now you will see that which I will do to Egypt, because with a mighty hand he will drive them out of his land. That's the conclusion of the Torah portion. Why is the Torah telling this, this the story of the past? Not just that we know history. It's also that we understand what is in stock for the future. As the commentators explain, there are many commentators, but one of them is the Kliyakar, is a famous commentator on um, 17th century rabbi of Eastern Europe, in which he explains that the story is telling us, and what the meaning of God's response, now you will see, is that God is saying, from the very notion that it's getting dark, this itself should be your sign that the redemption is very, very close. Because that's the nature of things. Moments before dawn, it gets extra dark. In the winter, he says, moments before sunrise, it gets frigid, the temperature drops, and it gets extra cold. When um, we see by, also he says, when a person is ill, um, moments, if God forbid, if they pass away, moments before they die, sometimes the person will look as if they are coming back to life, they're healthier, they're, they're feeling better, they'll sit up on the bed, and so on and so forth. That's just because before something is extinguished, it strengthens itself. For that reason, he says, when evil is about to be destroyed and about to be eliminated forever and ever, it flexes its muscles, it pounds on its chest to try to make itself seem big and strong. God is saying to the Jewish people, or God is saying to Moses, if you see Pharaoh behaving in an extra vicious manner, that's because the, the darkness and the exile is about to disappear. A little bit of a deeper explanation in this concept is gleaned from the, chas the, the writings of Hasidism, of Rav Shneer Zalman, of Liyadi, the first Chabad Rebbe, in his, in his incredible book, Teachings on the Torah, uh, Torah Or and Lakuti Torah, so in two places is where the Alter Rebbe talks about this concept. And he says, the idea is as follows. Before every divine revelation, it is preceded by an enormous concealment. It's like before one can exhale, one has to inhale. Before God exhales powerful godly infusion into the world, there is first a concealment. And the greater the revelation, the greater the concealment. For example, in a human being, if you want to exhale, if you want to blow with a lot of force, you first take a deep breath inward, and the energy goes from the outside in, deep, deep, deep into the person's lungs, and then they will be trans transmitted outward. So it is before God is going to infuse his presence into the world in an open way, that's what redemption is, there is first going to be a concealment. And over that's how he explains is the general concept of exile. Exile is not about punishment. It's not about God's neglect or abandonment of us. It's because God wants to share something deeper and something higher. And that's why he first hides his face. And he draws his revelation into himself. So to the world, it's dark, it's cold, 
There is concealment. It gets difficult. It gets hard. We experience suffering and pain. But that's an indication of the light. And he explains that when it gets to the final moments before the revelation, it gets the darkest ever. As we saw with the story with, with God and Moses. And he says, always the concealment is always commensurate with the revelation. The greater the revelation to come, the greater the concealment. So in Egypt, the revelation that was going to come was the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. The giving of the Ten Commandments. That was an enormous revelation. And because of that, there was a concealment of 210 years of darkness preceded that enormous revelation. However, he says, in order to have an understanding of how magnificent it is going to be, the coming of Moshiach, the divine revelation that's going to be at the time of the up-and-coming re re redemption that is about to happen momentarily, compared to the going out of Egypt. The inhaling then was 210 years. The inhaling now, since we've had the temple, the, this current exile, is close to 2,000 years. 2,000 years of divine concealment. And just like in Egypt, the last seconds before the redemption, it got excruciatingly dark. There it was for six months. So too it is now. What we are experiencing in the last couple of months is part of the pre-redemption concealment. It's a darkness. It's painful. It's difficult. But it's only a sign that the redemption is on hand. And when you compare the time periods, over there it was a concealment of about six months of excruciating hardship. Here we're already in extra darkness for 30 years. The Lubavitcher Rebbe told us that the redemption is already ready and that Moshiach is already in the world 30 years ago. And what happened immediately after that, the Rebbe had a stroke, and then the Lubavitcher Rebbe seemed, we had Gimel Tamuz, and physically the Rebbe, to our physical eyes, has left this world and became dark. And immediately at, during that time is when Oslo began which brought horrific tragedy upon Israel. The first intifada, the second intifada, and all the suffering leading into October 7th and the difficulties that there are now. Our heart should not become disheartened. We should hear the words of God answering Moshe. And God is saying, recognize, right before the light, it gets darker. Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, adds deeper explanation. He says, why the, why the inhaling? We gave an example of inhaling and exhaling. Another example is there was a big earthquake in Japan. They were worried about a tsunami. But we remember the um, massive tsunami that happened a couple of years ago in Indonesia, Sri Lanka. It was a horrific natural event where hundreds of thousands of people died. So during that um, Tsunami, uh, it is, you, can, you can see videos of it. It's, it's pretty scary. It's, what happens is that in the, in the morning, people wake, woke up in the morning and they were in resort towns in, in, on, in resorts next to the ocean. People looked out over the water. They were at the waterfront and they saw that the water receded. How much did it recede? Like it went far, far, far. People kind of thought it was neat and cool. They could run out onto the beach and they saw dead fish and stuff like there, wondering what in the world's going on over here. But those who understood knew that they better get out of there very quick. Because before the ocean is going to extend itself outward with a massive wave, first it sucks inward and it pulls all the way, all the way in before it flows out. And that happens with all divine revelation. A darkness before the light. So Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi adds insight. Why does God do this? And he gives the example of a parent with a child. A father, a mother. They love their child so much. There's such a deep connection. And the child loves the parent. The child is young, two, three years old. Loves playing in the mother's, in the mother's presence, in the father's presence. But when the father wants to reveal how deeply, how much the child really, really, really craves the closeness of the father, the father goes and plays hide and seek. 
The father hides himself. The child suddenly looks up from his toys and notices that his daddy is not there and he starts looking around and then he gets scared and he starts crying and sobbing and crying, crying, daddy, 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 where are you? And that's exactly what the father wanted. He wanted the child to express, to come to feel his own desire, how deeply he desires his father. So it is with God. God conceals himself so that we will desire him with a greater yearning, with a greater, with a greater longing. And if you take a look in Israel, you take a look across the world, Jews across the world are feeling so much more connected to Judaism. They want to study Torah. They want to do mitzvot. People that have been so alienated from their Jewish experience are feeling it now to a much greater degree. Not that we're, 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 we're giving, trying to give explanations of why the pain and the suffering, the pain and the suffering the Jewish people have done more than their share. But, on the, but it is important to understand that the tshuva, the return to God, has happened already in a very, very big way. And now we are ready, ready for the revelation. To add one very important point, Rabbeinu Bachaya, great, great commentator on, on the Torah, somewhere in the 11th or 12th century, writes in his last piece on the book of Shemos. He brings the verse that I mentioned earlier. As the days you went out of Egypt, God says, so will be in the future. I will show you wonders as the days that you went out of Egypt. And he says that this redemption that we are currently awaiting is exactly the same like the first redemption. And just like in the first redemption, after the Redeemer was revealed, it got super dark. But he adds a very important thing. And the hatred and the animosity to the Jewish people increased. He says, so it is going to be by the up and coming redemption. After the Redeemer has already been revealed in the world, there will be a concealment. There will be great hardship. And he says the following chilling statement. The world, it will, anti-Semitism will explode globally around the entire world. Literally, like a prophecy. We thought that post-Holocaust, we're kind of over. In the modern world, we're kind of over. It's definitely that never again. And here we had a mini-Holocaust with millions of people across the world cheering it on. Or people not willing to admit that the, the, the atrocities that were done to women, the horrors that were done, it, it, it's mind-blowing. How can that be? It's obviously completely super rational. And he adds that part of the reason why God does that is to confuse the forces of darkness in the world and to eventually, at the time of the redemption, he will punish those that have caused pain and suffering to God's children, to the Jewish people. So my friends, my brothers, my sisters, let's hold on. It's about to happen. Let's hope very soon. Let's hope it's already now, this week, this month, definitely this year. We are waiting. We are sure Moshiach is about to come.